Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 2021 Delta Murphy Lecture here at the University of Southern California and the Wrigley Institute. I'm Joe Arba, and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies here uh, at USC. Uh, before we begin, uh, it's important for me to let you know that the Wrigley Institute is located on the sacred and traditional lands of this region's first native peoples. They are the Tongva Gabrielino. Um, the Tongva are the original stewards of this uh, land, and they continue in this, in this role today, and we are very grateful to them uh, for that. Um, the Wrigley Institute's mission is to inspire through research, education, and engagement solutions to the world's most pressing sustainability challenges. Um, and one of these pressing challenges is in finding ways to make sure that a broad diversity of people not only participate in the scientific enterprise, but that a more diverse group of people actually have an opportunity to lead the scientific enterprise. So we've gathered here today to talk in a roundtable uh, about the topic of women's science and the road to inclusive uh, leadership. It's apropos that we address this topic as part of our Delta Murphy Lecture. The Delta Murphy Lecture is named after uh, Ms. Delta Murphy, who graduated from USC in 1947 and dedicated her life to public service and leadership. She, for example, served two terms as the mayor of Whittier, California, and later as the chairperson of the LA County Departmental, uh, Department of Regional Planning. Uh, while she chaired the Planning Commission, she was charged with developing the first general plan for Santa Catalina Island, where the Wrigley Marine Science Center is located. Uh, and that led her to be uh, the chair, actually, of our institute for, for many years. Uh, though Delta died in 2013, her legacy of leadership lives on through our fond memories of her and through this lecture series. And I want to acknowledge all of the supporters of the Delta Murphy Lecture, uh, and especially her grandson, Breen Murphy, who's uh, joining us today. Also in the spirit of diversity and inclusion, I wanna point out that this year's Delta Murphy Lecture is co-sponsored by us at the Wrigley Institute, but also the USC Environmental Studies Program, uh, the USC Marine and Environmental Biology Program, and it's actually one of the signature events this year in USC's 2021 uh, DEI Week. So my sincere thanks to everybody uh, who worked behind the scenes to help us put this uh, event together. I also want to thank all of you for joining us today. The response to this series, uh, le lecture has been amazing. Uh, we had almost 500 people uh, RSVP, and we look forward to seeing you uh, out there in the audience as we uh, get into the conversation. In a second, uh, you'll see a poll pop up on your screens, and we'd really appreciate it if you'd let us know what groups you're representing as members of our audience. That might help us to steer the conversation in certain kinds of directions. And uh, there it is. Um, and also, today's event is meant to be a discussion. So rather than waiting until the end, please ask your questions and make your comments using the Q&A dashboard on your screens while the discussion amongst the panelists is unfolding. This will help the moderator uh, and the speakers move the discussion in the directions that are of most interest uh, to you. So without further ado, let me um, have the privilege of introducing today's panelists. Before I do, uh, I want to say that I've had the tremendous honor in my career of, of not only knowing them, but working with all of them. And I can say without a hint of hyperbole uh, that to me, each and every one of them is the very epitome of leader. So I'll begin with uh, Dr. Don Wright. Not only is she a professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State University, Dawn is also the chief scientist of the Environmental Systems Research Institute, which you might know as ESRI. It is the world's leading uh, GIS company. She has advised government. She has advised the private sector and NGOs. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Geological Society of America, the Oceanography Society, the California Academy of Sciences. And as of last year, and this is really cool, she was elected a member of the world-renowned Explor Explorers Club. Joining Dawn is uh, Dr. Hope Jaron. Hope is an award-winning paleobiologist. She is the recipient of three Fulbrights and is one of four scientists and the only woman to have been awarded both of the Young Investigator Medals given within the Earth Sciences. She's now the J. Tuzo Wilson Professor at the University of Oslo in Norway. And uh, importantly for this conversation, she is the author of one of the most authentic um, and honest books about science and about being a scientist that I've ever read. It's called Lab Girl. It's this book here. It was a New York Times bestseller, uh, and it was placed on the must-read lists of many groups, among others, President Barack Obama. So that's a very good company to have. Her new book is about climate change uh, and is called The Story of More. And then joining Dawn and Hope is Dr. Rita Colwell. 
Rita's research focuses on global infectious diseases, water, and health. She developed an international network to address emerging infectious diseases and water issues, including safe drinking water for both the developed and the developing world. This is um, amazing. She has been awarded 63 honorary degrees, and she is the recipient of a very long and distinguished list of awards that I won't read in full, but I will tell you some of them. The National Medal of Science awarded by President George W. Bush, the Order of the Rising Sun uh, 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 bestowed by the Emperor of Japan, the Stockholm Water Prize awarded by the King of Sweden, and, and this is amazing, she is a Knight in the Legion of Honor in France. Uh, importantly, Dr. Caldwell served as the 11th director of the National Science Foundation, which is where I met her first, and she was the very first woman to hold this post. She has also authored many books, I think it's 19, and her latest book is this one, A Lab of One's Own, One Woman's Personal Journey Through Sexism in Science. And then the moderator for today's discussion is our very own Dr. Carly Kenkel. Carly is the Gablian Assistant Professor of Biological Science in marine and environmental biology. She's a 2019 Sloan Research Fellow and the 2020 re recipient of the International Coral Reef Society's Early Career Scientist Award. Uh, she is also a woman leading the scientific enterprise through her service on a variety of boards, including the steering committee for the National Science Foundation, National Science Foundation's Research Coordination Network on Evolution in Changing Seas. You are in for an amazing conversation, so I will get out of the way and turn it over to my colleague, Carly. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, certainly no pressure following up from this incredible crew of women, and I really appreciate um, the invitation to moderate and for you creating the space for us to have this conversation. So uh, you've got an incredible diversity of backgrounds. We just heard all of your accolades um, from both academy and the private sector and government. I'm curious about the differences between government, the academy and the private sector in terms of how women and women in leadership are viewed. Is one different from the other? Is one further ahead than the other? And why, if so, or why not? Would John, like would you like to tackle it? So I'll, I'll, I'll dive in uh, first. I felt the uh, the camera eyes all oh, looking at me for some reason. So I will dive in first because uh, this question of uh, women in leadership in different sectors is, is a very difficult one. And so I'm going to speak only from my own experience and very briefly so that my colleagues can, can chime in as well. So I, I came to my current post in industry after 17 years in academia. So uh, I, I feel as though I have uh, one, one foot in, in each sector. Now, it, but in academia, it was very interesting because my own personal st story there was that I was the first assistant professor hired in my department in 12 years. So, so it felt as though I was uh, really uh, treading new, new ground there, uh, but at the same time, there were a lot of the same expectations in terms of uh, the three the three legged stool in academia of teaching, uh, research, slash grantsmanship, and service. But when I left uh, full time academia to take on this role in industry, I uh, again was the first person uh, hired into into what was essentially a brand new position in that company. But instead of there being uh, the normal landscape uh, ahead of me, uh, that was a completely new role. And I was told by my CEO to essentially uh, make up this position as I went along uh, to make my own way, to make my own goalposts. They knew that they needed a chief scientist within a software company, but they didn't know what that meant. And so they wanted me to, to make it so uh, and to uh, to make it so that it was a respected position within the company. And there, I, I had uh, challenges there, uh, which, which we can talk about perhaps in, in another, another question. But one of the things that I appreciated about uh, this post, this current post in industry, is that science communication right from the beginning uh, was it was clear that that was an essential and a critical part of my job. Whereas in academia, science communication uh, was something that was not as well accepted 
Uh, it was not something that was baked into the promotion and tenure process. Uh, there were many uh, institutional barriers uh, that my colleagues and I have, have talked about in terms of breaking through so that science communication is something that is secondhand and something that is valued. Uh, it, and this is for both women and men. Uh, the, the other difference for me though is the microaggression and, and harassment uh, experience uh, throughout industry uh, is, is seen, I think, to be uh, higher for, for uh, women, women of color than perhaps in academia, but there, there is so much discussion about that across the board uh, that, that that is also still a very open uh, question. Uh, one final thing is that the management of, of energy and time uh, in industry, which is something that is so important for women and women in leadership, uh, avoiding the burnout factor, I found that to be a little, just a little better uh, in industry than academia. What about my colleagues? Well, I, I'll, I'll speak up. Um, I've actually spent time in academia and uh, in government and then in industry. I felt that in academia, the, the rules were pretty much laid out, which is not to say that it was easy to, to fill them, but, but you knew that um, if you did obtain grant funding and if you published um, papers in um, sufficiently strong peer-reviewed journals uh, and carried out your teaching duties that you at least had a, um, let's say, a, a, an equal fight in the game. And, and, I, and I know that can be argued because if you have the wrong chairman or the wrong dean, you can be in deep trouble. But fundamentally, if you are really hardworking and successful, you, you can be successful in achieving advancement and become a leader in the community. Uh, I must say that women have to do twice as much to gain um, half the advantage. So, so at least in my time, and I think it still probably is the case, you really do have to put in a lot of time, which can be very difficult when you're dealing with family at the same time, small children. The, the government um, um, sphere, again, does have sort of rules, you might say, in quotation marks. Um, and there, there are uh, pretty straightforward, in at least in the National Science Foundation, it was pretty clear uh, what your, your, your promotion path would be. Um, and I found, I really found working in government, and I know I'm spoiled because the National Science Foundation is really, in, in my view, the best agency uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, and I enjoyed it immensely and had tremendously good staff to work with. Industry was another matter. Um, I have never encountered such drastic sexism and rudeness and um, chicanery, I guess, as, as in the uh, venture capital sphere. Uh, I started a company which is successful but I can tell you, I have plenty of scars to uh, show for the 10 years to get it launched. Uh, it's amazing. And, and I, I really um, laud uh, women who are successful in business, or at least in the biotechnology, um, computer science type of business. You really have to be tough, but you can be uh, extravagantly successful if, if you if you work hard and, and are able to succeed, but it's a real tough road to home. Okay, so uh, I'm Hope Jaron, and I address the academic question because I've never done anything with my life except to go to school every fall. And I started in kindergarten and you go, you go enough and you're the student, you keep going and you're, you're the teacher and then you're the professor, you keep going. And I don't know, they, they take away your keys at some point, but um, uh, I come from, I was raised in a, a small town, a small factory town surrounded by agriculture. 
Um, and my family had been there for generations. And about half of my graduating class left at 16 to work in the factory. And I wanted an education so badly. I wanted to, I, I felt, uh, I felt a, a spiritual uh, obligation to pursue my education that my mother and my grandmothers had wanted so badly, but had never been able to obtain. There were things that I wanted to know and things that I wanted to learn and figure out for myself. And nobody was ever gonna stop me uh, or take that away. And I had that attitude the whole time. And, and what came with that was I was gonna put up with, there was no amount of crap I, that I wasn't gonna put up with in order to get you know, what I wanted. And so I spent a lot of my academic career, um, I'm fairly introverted and I created a very small space where I could do almost anything I wanted. And I was very, very happy there for a long time. Um, and I had, and it was populated by very special people. <laughs> and um, then um, I finally got to this, to the point where I felt like I knew enough from doing that obsessively, you know, for 20, 25 years that I had stories to tell that I, that I could, that I could share that with people and that they, they might, you know, people that there were all these people out there that hadn't spent 25 years the same way I had but that, you know, maybe there was something special that came out of spending my time that way. That was a story that I could tell. And then I turned my attention to trying to make that happen, which was, you know, another climb. And that's where I am now. I actually, um, I, I'm molting sort of out of academia. I gave up tenure. I moved to Norway and uh, I'm at a place where I don't, I'm not really sure what's next. Um, but I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you all for sharing those stories. You, I noticed some really interesting synergies between what you were saying, hope you saying now, just kind of noting that your goals outweigh the obstacles in terms of what you were willing to put up with moving forward. Um, Rita, noting how much um, chicanery and rudeness you faced in trying to start an industry position and even Don questioning whether um, industry does deserve its reputation for um, higher levels of sexism and microaggressions than potentially academia. Since it seems like that seems to be a common thread, how do you function in a professional space when you're not welcome, um, when you experience these pressures, especially when you're expected to lead? I'll, I'll, I'll start by um, pointing out that um, I think you have to have a great deal of um, perseverance and um, the ability to overlook uh, what obstacles come in your way. And I, and I like what Hope was saying, because I agree that you, you just determine to get accomplished what you know has to be accomplished and you find a way over, under, or around the obstacles and there are always lots of them. Uh, I think also having in, in your mind um, what it is you want to accomplish in general terms, not explicit details step by step, but in general, where you want to go and where you, how you want to get there, that helps enormously. And, and I do like the communication comment that Dawn made because communicating with your coworkers, particularly those whom, for whom you are serving as a leader becomes really important for them to understand your commitment to what you want to achieve and having them on board, uh, having them with you, not dragging them behind or running too far ahead of them, but having them work together as a team. I think that's how at least I found it most, the most successful path um, to achieving the goals that I had, had hoped for. I think, um... When, when Hope mentioned that she had uh, given up tenure, uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and and uh, we, we have another connection point there, maybe among all three of us, uh, because I, I had to give up tenure as well. And that is almost like the unpardonable sin in academia <laughs> to give that up. <laughs> uh, but it, 
uh, it can empower you with with so with so much because for for me when I gave up my tenure uh, at my institution in order to start this full time job uh, at at Esri, uh, it was frightening, but it also gave me this weird sense of of courage and. Uh, almost like a, a superhero. It's like I am stepping out to do this, and uh, I I know that this is right for me, and I uh, expect uh, the uh, the respect that goes along with having made that step. Uh, because one of the uh, obstacles for me when I first started in my role uh, was that there was not consensus across my organization that that I or my role was needed. And I've learned that uh, in order for a leader to be successful, especially in industry and taking into account what Rita has, has said about uh, the, the culture in industry, you need to have cooperation, you need to have collaboration, but you need acceptance of your leadership. And so for me, it took a while to pave that uh, that acceptance uh, and to, and, and I was told, I, we're not going to advocate for you. We're throwing you into the deep end of the pool. Uh, you are going to have to fight your own battles. Uh, you are going to have to uh, raise your own voice. You're gonna to have to make your own connections. And in essence, you are going to have to prove yourself. And if you prove yourself, uh, then everything else will, will come along. Now the definition of that varies according to what what company you're in, I would say, uh, and and thank goodness it, it worked for me uh, in my company. But I'll, I'll make one one more comment before passing to Hope because one thing that I see happening, at least in the geospatial industry, which is different from the venture capital startup world that Rita has has conquered is that there is a real sense now of performative hypocrisy. Uh, companies do not want to just be putting out statements about racial equity and about caring about the environment and letting that be all there is to it. So there is more of an awareness now that there needs to be uh, a, a multi-dimensionality, a, a, of course, the diversity and inclusion and equity that people are taking that seriously. Companies are taking that seriously. And that, that is making it much easier for those of us who, who have been there uh, for the last few years and have risen to uh, leadership within uh, some of these companies. I think I would just add uh, to your comments, your excellent comments, that um, it's been shown, studies have shown that when, you, when the boards of the company and the, uh, the uh, composition of the workforce is uh, diverse, they make more money, it's more profitable because in yeah. fact, more dimensions. And, and the other comment I would make is I think success is when you have an agenda that you know what, what you want to achieve, that makes a big difference than if you're, because then you're less likely to fail. Uh, you'd be more directive. Um, my advice for uh, uh, functioning in spaces where you're not welcome is to um, spend as little time as humanly possible in them. Um, <laughs> I, I, honestly, yeah, no, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't go or, or avoid it or whatever, but you know, you've got to create a space somewhere else that's your space. Mm -hmm. And that's where you nurture yourself. That's where you uh, trust the people that are trustworthy. That's where you plant, you know, your self esteem and your image of yourself and your moral standards and all that. And then the harsh <laughs> or unwelcoming, you know, all of those other places are places that you move into strategically and you work for the good of what the, the precious thing that you have that lives in that other space. I mean, that's, I don't, I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's my answer. No, I, I think that's uh, just to express my excitement. <laughs> I think that is so true because you, it's like finding 
pathways down a, a slope if you if you are water and you you find the gullies or the um, the channels uh, that allow you to to get to where you need to go and you make end runs around the difficult people and you you do choose to in fact I was told that when you get tenure that means that you now have the the power and the ability to work with only nice people you get to choose <laughs> you would like to work with in order to get to those uh, those end goals. And I think that's true. So I think what, what Hope is saying is, is totally true. And, uh, and Rita, I hope you've, you've had similar. Well, what I'd like to say is that there are some really good guys out there, men and women. Uh, and if you find them, uh, uh, as I was fortunate uh, in having throughout my career, uh, key individuals who were supportive, um, who really, helped me with good advice, more to the point they actually uh, smoothed the way in assisting and getting grants and um, you know, locating positions. So it isn't uh, a totally hateful world. There are jewels and um, lumps of gold amongst them, the dross, so to speak, and it's important to find them and to work uh, closely with them and take advantage of the opportunities in a good way. I think, and just generally, I think when you don't fit the mold for whatever reason, um, it's really important to give yourself permission to break the rules because the rules were constructed to keep those who do fit the mold in charge, right? So, so by necessity, you have to break the rules to change the rules. I, I, I don't know if you agree, but I don't see another way. I think the three of us don't fit molds. Otherwise, we wouldn't be where we are. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, so um, yes, I agree. I, it, it, I guess the only point I would make is that it doesn't have to be, um, you know, carrying a big stick to poke in somebody's eye every five minutes. Um, you can work with people, but you have to find the ones with whom you can work and find the the the, the, chally, the channels and the and the pathways as Dawn pointed out, that, and you hope as well, where you can, can find a smooth path. Mm -hmm. Certainly my career was not a straight line. It was pretty zigzaggy, but I got what I wanted to achieve. This is a fascinating conversation so far. And it, thinking of what you're saying, Hope, about, and you don't agreeing, like, oh, it, if you're not welcome in a space, like try not to spend time in that space, create your own space. As a new faculty member, you know, I think of my lab as my space and my people, and that that's where I have the power to affect the most change. And then I hear you saying, oh, I left academia, like I left that behind. And, you know, we have a question from an audience member, which is, you know, when you were making this decision to leave academia, was that because an opportunity was presenting itself or did you feel like there was a lack of support or resources you know, or that, that environment did become bad that kind of prompted you to move? Well, for me, it was a fantastic opportunity <clears throat> to become the uh, director of the National Science Foundation. And I must confess that I, I was a bit of a chicken in that I went the emeritus route. So I kept my connection <clears throat> with the university because I, I really love uh, the environment. Working with students is, is the most, um, rewarding experience I think anybody could have. And, and for me, it was a combination of both where I was just about at the point of burnout. Uh, the climate in my uh, department uh, had deteriorated for me. Uh, and so it was, uh, and I was about to go on sabbatical. So uh, that was uh, fantastic outlet because I knew I was going to get relief because I was going to be on sabbatical, but my sabbatical turned into uh, being hired uh, by, by Esri. And uh, it was a very unusual situation where my intention and my arrangement with my dean was to uh, have an extended sabbatical of two years to go and work for Esri and to get them started on their science agenda and then to return to campus. But uh, Esri's intent was, you know, once you move down here, you're full time, we've got you. 
and we're going to keep giving you these fascinating projects and we're going to draw you in and we, we've got you. So that, that's, that's what happened uh, to me. Uh, and it was very, uh, there was also something else that I, I can't really talk about that happened uh, in terms of a very aggressive uh, situation that caused me to uh, say, okay, I'm not coming back to this institution. And I am going to take the step to resign and to give up my tenure uh, and to switch my status to uh, adjunct so that I still have ties to the university. But the tenure and the lab and the possibility of returning full-time, that's gone. Uh, it was all, all very uh, frightening, but again, it was empowering. Uh, it was like uh, I teased Joe about uh, our, our joint love of Iron Man and was like, you know, putting on the Iron Man suit. And once that helmet locks down, you're, you, you've got the power and off you go. So it, so far it's turning out. Um, I, I think I grew up a little bit. I mean, it only took about 25 years and I, and I, of being a professor where I hit this stage where I was less selfish about, you know, how am I going to get smarter today? What's the next thing that I need to know? What, it, what is the next uh, big answer that I can come up with? And I started to say, well, why do I know all this stuff? What is, what, what is the purpose or the meaning of me having figured all this stuff out? What am I going to do with it? And I was also, you know, you get some you've been in the system for a while and I was starting to go to Rita. <laughs> I was starting to go and be on NSF panels where we would work for days to whittle 200 plus proposals down to 25. And they would tell us to pick eight and fund them at like half the level. And, and I just thought it was ridiculous. You know, you could double the amount of money we were giving away and not have it. I mean, there's just all these great ideas and it was just no, no chance. I mean, it was, it was like, why, why are we writing these proposals? And I also sat on tenure committees where I actually saw things like, you know, people who walked in cold and they hadn't opened the file and they didn't like this person because they were in a women's studies department and the women's studies professor at their daughter's school had soured them on Thanksgiving or something, you know, I'm mean, crazy stuff like this that you know, you hear, you, you kind of think it might exist, but you see it with your own eyes. And I also I had a class where I talked about the last 50 years of, of consumption and how it led to climate change. And I kept teaching it at the university and it continued to be an elective and it got these great ratings and I couldn't get it part of the curriculum. I couldn't get it, you know, to mean something in terms of the degree. And I wrote it down as a book and it became a bestseller. And, and I also saw the university grow into something that I could never have afforded myself in terms of, of money. It was just became a place that would have been totally out of reach for me. And I couldn't, there was just a point where I, I couldn't do it anymore. I, I did it for a long time. And I tried my best to do it well. And then the bottom fell out in a weird way. And I have to, I have to go forward and, and see, see, see what, what the way forward is. I don't have a, I, it, somebody else talk. <laughs> well, let me just say that um, when I went to the National Science Foundation, um, I had a clear agenda in my mind. <clears throat> Firstly, the budget had to be increased. And I was successful because it was a time when compromises in Congress did occur. And I was successful increasing the budget about 63%, I, I, a few billion more. It would have been nice to have doubled, um, but it still represents the one period of time when the largest increase in the budget occurred. So I'm very proud of that. I also wanted to double the graduate student stipend and I succeeded in getting that done as well because um, it was much too small and it was, when you have students living on food stamps, it doesn't make any sense. And so I was pleased to have succeeded. And then I also wanted to make sure that interdisciplinary science would be recognized. And I'm not so sure that I succeeded, but I got it started 
And that's where the climate change types of, of programs come in, hope. And so biocomplexity turned out to be quite successful. And, and the advance program, which was to enable women to an, achieve uh, positions in, uh, in academia has been very successful. And, and thanks to the cooperation and the wonderful contribution of my deputy, Joe Bodonia, the late Joe Bodonia, who convinced me that you had to hold the deans and the presidents to, at uh, feet to the fire and make them sign off on the awards of the substantial funding for advance. And as a result, some 20 years later, in doing an analysis for my book, um, I found that about 9,000 or more women have been appointed and are faculty in American universities as a result of the advanced program. So, so having an agenda, knowing what it is you need to achieve uh, makes it possible. And so I, I think um, for that reason, I think um, with, the, with the colleagues, we were able to, to make some, some significant advances. And I'm hoping now with the new administration that there will be a significant increase in the National Science Foundation budget. The, 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 the country needs it, our young people need it, and um, science, engineering, and math and technology needs it. So building on that, it, um, we have a question, another question from a student. Um, do you think the lack of women and women in like senior science leadership roles, is that an ongoing problem? Is that something that's changing? Is getting more women into leadership roles part of what changing the culture is about? Yes, uh, absolutely. It, it, it's getting better, but it's still a problem. Uh, in my view, uh, there, there just aren't enough of us. And as a black woman, one of the things that's a challenge for me is that there's so few of us as black women who are at certain levels that uh, many of us are talking about getting tired or exhausted because we are the few that people know about. And uh, therefore we, uh, it's, it's a high calling and it's a wonderful calling and uh, it's never a dull moment. And there, there's so many ways to give and to, and to lead and to, to advise and, and mentor and help. And I think one of the things uh, that I'm realizing now is that part of my, um, my leadership is keeping my eye open for uh, the generation that has come before me because so many of them now are ready. They're ready for leadership. They're looking for ways to be acknowledged they're looking to be appointed to, to committees. Uh, they are, uh, some of them are incorporating their own nonprofits. So for instance, there's a black and marine science uh, nonprofit that is uh, taking Twitter and Instagram and YouTube by storm. Uh, it, it's, it's not just a, a one-off uh, event. They have incorporated into a serious organization with some amazing uh, young men and women who who are looking to step up uh, to to be the next generation of leaders, but it's my responsibility as well to not only participate with them, but to promote them and to uh, suggest them for for these many these many opportunities. So it's one of those things where again, so many times we the, the Me Too movement. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of these movements, we all say the same thing. We thought this was going to be solved and we could move forward to, to other, other ways to, to solve societal problems. But here we are back again with, uh, with the same discussions, the same struggles, but that is apparently, that is, uh, that is our lot, that is our battlefield. So uh, onward we go. And uh, thank goodness for uh, students and postdocs and colleagues for all of us who, who give each other uh, strength and who uh, spur each other on. Uh, and I've read Lab Girl twice <laughs> to, to help me out as well as uh, some, other, some other books. 
So, so that that's my perspective. Well, there are, there are rules that that need to be changed, and it's clearly obvious that um, from the studies that have been done that if you have one token member of a search committee, you're not going to get an equitable evaluation of the candidates. And, and Hope has said this today much more um, strongly and, and emotionally strong than, than I am. But the point is clear that you need to have a balanced committee and then you will really call the candidates and come up with the best, well, regardless of whether they're male or female or, or, or what race or whatever. So that, that, that's one of the uh, obvious changes that, that needs to be made and, and is happening glacially, but it's happening. Uh, another, I think, is understanding innate bias, and, and that's become controversial lately, these charges that, that may or may not exist. But, but I think the studies show clearly, particularly the National Academy study that um, was done where applications were sent around the country, same application, same documentation, one with a male name and the other with a female name. And the offer <laughs> to the female was um, substantially less in salary, substantially less in responsibility, and frankly, substantially less and less likely to have been hired. So the, the, the bias is there uh, and, and needs to be recognized. What I, what I feel positive about is that people, men and women are speaking up. And that I think is the best of all, because in my time, 40 years ago, nobody said anything. But now um, people like Hope are saying, I'm not putting up with it, I'm, I'm speaking out. And, and um, that's what you did in your book. And I, I, I thank you for it. Um, thank you, Rita, that's very, this is very uh, uh, flattering coming from uh, um, you. I think, uh, I think more voices are always better. I mean, when, when I started out, I was the only woman in the room. I was the only girl in the physics class. I was the only faculty member. I was only, and now there's two, you know, there's not always three, but there's two and two and one and having one there is really different than none. God only knows what they say when there's nobody there. And having one there is really different. And having two in the room is some kind of tipping point, right? Because two can reinforce each other and be there for each other, et cetera. So I'm very excited what to see now, now that we're getting into the twos, because I think that's going to change everything. I don't, I don't know how to change everything. I mean, I, I suppose I should, but, but I don't. I, I, I think this, these are very, very big, complicated problems. I mean, you know, we talk about sexual harassment, we talk about um, unfairness and harm in many, many forms. And what I learned as a scientist is when you get to a very sticky, complicated problem, you always go back to the theory and start there. So I go back to feminist theory. And I say, <laughs> women's oppression comes down to three things. Pay for domestic labor, equal pay for equal work, reproductive rights, and sexual violence, right? And that at the at the at the basis of, of women's oppression of harm is one of those three things or some combination of those three things. And we have all of those in academia. Or maybe you can speak to that in industry, et cetera. We have problems with equal pay for equal work. We have problems with maternity leave and incorporating uh, identity as mother and parent into the academic work life. We have problems with uh, sexual violence, everything from exclusion and harassment all the way up to rape and murder within the academic setting. And so when in doubt, you know, we pick up and we fight on one of those three issues and you'll never go wrong. You know, I mean, I, I always get pinged for being, you know, aggressive and, and competitive, et cetera, but there is a time to be brave. And on those three issues, there is still a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Reed. I just wanted to, to say quickly because what, what Hope was saying made me think of the film Picture a Scientist. Because Picture a Scientist, if you haven't seen that documentary, 
it touches on on the, the feminist theory that hope is uh, was talking about and the experiences of uh, several brave uh, women across generations. Uh, but also it, it talks about the advocates and the allies now that we're seeing more and more so that they're the two, the ones, the twos, maybe the threes, three of us at my company, three of us out of 20 are directors. So there are three of us, but there's so many more who are advocates and allies to us. And that is becoming, I see more uh, male allies uh, Caucasian allies for people of color, straight allies for LBGTQIA+, uh, all, all of that. So, so that is, um, that's a light uh, that I see uh, for us. Maybe uh, Rita, uh, you were going to uh, I say something. Say the same, same, same thing, but I couch it differently, uh, but the same thing. And that is get yourself a posse. Yeah. I mean by that, find colleagues, women, uh, who are um, facing the same obstacles and get together. And um, uh, even if it's over coffee or over beer or, or lunch or dinner, on a regular basis and talk out uh, the challenges and knowing that it's the system and not you makes a huge difference. And it also leads to, um, for example, Nancy Hopkins getting together with the other yep. faculty, women faculty, and going to the president, Chuck Vest of MIT, and saying, look, we've measured the labs, and, and women are being shortchanged. We've, we've analyzed the, the, the money that's allowed for travel, and women are shortchanged. And, on and on. So the data were gathered and um, Chuck Best to his benefit, the late Chuck Best said, well, um, there is plenty of evidence here and we made changes. So I think get yourself a posse. And I would add, I would add end that meeting with your posse with the same question every time. Who is not here? Who did we, who did we miss? Who did we fail to include? How can we welcome them? Who else needs to be in this room? Because if you're doing it right, you know, that group gets bigger and bigger. That's right. Absolutely. That's really excellent advice. I have another question from a student that I think maybe I'm asking myself too, which is I, I see her and I, I'm listening to you and you've all done incredible things, right? You're, you are the iron women, you know, in your, in your super suits and, you know, how can maybe an average woman or someone who thinks of themselves as not someone who's necessarily going to achieve these great heights like is there how can we be effective and inclusive leaders without being overwhelmed by pressure to be like the best or the top or the the first the groundbreaker well i i don't think you have to reach to uh, direction that you don't feel comfortable doing. I mean, I don't mean that to not want to challenge yourself, that's fine. But, um, but I find joy in many things, so it's hard for me to say. Um, my husband and I were racing sailors, and so I spent my weekends uh, in regattas all around the country as well as working in the lab during the week. And there, I just learned a lot about um, camaraderie um, uh, because we we sailed in the nationals and we would travel, you know, to New Orleans and to the Great Lakes and uh, meet up with people with whom we'd be camping out. And there, I think, developing a sense of your own worth, which is what I think Hope has been trying to say in very very well. Um, is the is the important thing not because it, you know the adage um, um, when you die you or in your dying bed you're not going to be thinking I wish I'd spent more time at the office so I, I think or in the lab so I, I think um, balance 
one's life is important. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues for additional comment. Hope you want to go next. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the key to success is just longevity. You know, you show up to school in the fall enough times and they make you the teacher, right? I, <laughs> I mean, and I don't know if I can really address your question without getting somewhat spiritual. I don't know if that's appropriate here, but I, I firmly believe I was taught this and I've always believed that my value is not in what I do. It's not in what I can do or diminished by what I can't do. My only value is as a part of creation. And I, I do believe that. Um, and I believe that about all the important men who've done so many wonderful things and, and think that I'm so inadequate. I believe that their value is not in what they just said to me and not what they just accomplished. It is that they are also a piece of creation. And I believe that about you. And that is, the value you have and that is the value you will have regardless of the road you go down so if you instinctively i think kind of let the things you love pull you down the road it will become the road you're supposed to be on um and measuring yourself i mean you know, you listen to somebody say a lot of great things about us, that we've done these great things. I can give you the number of some people who will tell you I've done terrible things or I've done nothing or I'm completely over. So, I mean, you, you really, there's no, as a woman, you know, you live your life with people telling you what you're supposed to be. It never goes away. It just never does. So um, in the end, you know, you just are kind of, <laughs> kind of have to resort to being what you are out of out of lack of other choices is what I found. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And it, it is a spiritual thing, uh, I think, uh, for, for me as well. Because uh, and I don't think any of us went into our careers saying I'm going to I'm going to do this so that I can be elected into the National Academy one day or I'm going to do this so that I will one day be a, a Oceanography Society fellow. You know, I I really had no, uh, no, aware I don't want to say no awareness, but for, for the most important thing is indeed that sense of self and doing what you really love. Uh, I, I just could not get away from looking at all of these images of the seafloor and uh, all of the rock samples that I had and making these maps after maps after maps. I was just, I just loved it. And it, it, I was, I felt comfortable with it. I was good at it. There were challenges, but uh, it, it was something that uh, was, I think it was something that I was meant to do. And that's the most important thing is to find that niche and do that to the best of your ability and to be filled with joy while doing it because you need to have that overflow of joy to get you through the difficulties and frustrations <laughs> and the doors that are gonna be slammed shut uh, you'd need that joy to keep overflowing. And then uh, as, as Hope and, and Rita have been saying it, you, you, you follow that path. So I think for students, the dangerous part is not being able to find that path. And, and that initial struggle is, is so real. And uh, it's, for me, it was the most important part of my uh, job as a professor. I, that, that's what I loved the most was helping uh, an undergraduate or a graduate student find the path, find the, the door to open. Once they open that door uh, and, and get going, then, then they're off, they're off and running. And then whatever happens uh, in your career, and, the, and as Rita said, the twists and the turns, um, uh, the ups and the downs, uh, and Hope has told that story as well, uh, that that's part of the, part of the beautiful journey and make sure think, that you're, you're enjoying other things along the way, like you see all my Legos behind me. I love just detoxing and de-stressing with, um, with a Lego kit. <laughs> Sorry, Hope, go ahead. 
You know, I think we're very good at encouraging students to think about their weaknesses. Do you know enough statistics? Yeah. Do you, yeah. have you had enough math? Or, or, you know, are you good at this? Which part of this do you need? To need? But we don't tell them, what part of this is easy? What part of it do you love? What yeah. part of it do you just seem to have a knack for that other people would give their right arm for? What, what are the things that, that are, feel like play more than work, more than school? And somewhere in the middle, and it, and that's a very hard, hard uh, task to sit down and really work that out for yourself. It takes a long time, yeah, but inside there, somewhere is the kernel of what of what you're meant to do, of, of what you're meant to find and follow. Nobody can find it for you, but you can find it yourself if you get some encouragement and you put in the work. I do believe that because I've seen it many, many times. Yeah. I would add too that um, to be prepared as well when you do make a discovery that is important uh, to realize, and, and you'll be criticized because I can tell you that uh, having made some interesting observations that were to totally novel with respect to color and work that I've done over the last 40 years, I keep in mind Einstein's comment that when you have a new theory, a new discovery, you have to wait until your critics die before it's accepted. So don't be don't be um, put back, put put down by it. Just know that you've made the discovery, you've made the contribution, and um, you can take your own personal credit for it. Well, thank you. We are we're running out of time, but I, I really appreciated all of those stories, and I, I certainly know what you mean about the um, finding your spark. It was about halfway through my PhD that working on my project and my advisor said, ha, now I own you. And I was like, excuse me, you don't own me. But what he meant was that you're so into it now, you're not gonna stop. Like you've got, you're so focused on the, the problem that you're solving that you just can't let it go. That passion is there. Um, so we are, unfortunately we are out of time. So I wanna say um, final thoughts. What advice would you wanna to give to the woman um, and diverse scientists interested in becoming the leaders of tomorrow. I've got, get my posse. What are the other things that I need to know? Uh, Go ahead, Rita. I just said, never give up. Never give up, hope. Network, but make it substantial. When you read somebody's paper, you find a good paper, you read a lot of papers, you find a really good one, you write the first author a letter and you tell them why it was good. You write, you write the big wig on the author list in email and you say, I saw the art, I like this graph, this really means something. Those people will remember you. That's a meaningful way to network. Thank you, and Don. And, and I would say, uh, just as you need to find your niche, you need to, to find uh, a, good, a good mentor, a good advisor, someone who accepts you as a whole person who is invested in your success, uh, someone who will, who will be willing to help reduce uh, the barriers that prevent you from making your maximum contribution. Uh, oftentimes students think that they cannot change their advisor or they can't change their situation. And you, you need to have the courage to make that change, find, find that, in addition to finding your niche, find that person who can who can help you. Thank you, and thank you so, go ahead. To the leaders in the world, you don't fight a war with half an army, and you need all the talent, no matter what the gender, or what the race, or what the background. We need every all the brains for the 21st century. Excellent point. And with that, I'd, I'd love, I could talk to you for hours, but unfortunately <laughs> I have to stop. Um, I sincerely appreciate your time. I really appreciate your honesty. And I'd like to invite Joe back to close us out. Thank you very much, Carly. When I, when I joined the Institute a few months ago, we promised ourselves that we wouldn't do fluffy engagements anymore, that we would have conversations with, with consequence. And this is our first one. And I, I'm frankly in awe of just what I heard and, and, and so appreciative of everyone's willingness to, to share so honestly and, and frankly, so boldly. So 
Thank you to all of you. Thank you to our panel, especially you, Carly, for, for being our moderator, but certainly uh, uh, to you, Rita, Hope, uh, and Don. You are not only leaders, you are colleagues, and importantly, you are such terrific friends. Um, I also want to um, give a shout out, and I'm not sure if the control room can turn cameras on, but none of this is possible uh, without Jessica Dutton, Diane Kim, Katie Shavostal, and Amber Brown. They work behind the scenes to make all of this happen, so huge kudos to them. Um, the last thing I'll say is if you RSVP, you'll get an email with a link to our YouTube page where you can see um, um, this again, and I really do encourage you, even if you did watch it, to watch it again. Uh, I encourage you to take Hope's advice on networking. There are four amazing women um, on the screen. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to them. And, um, and once again, thank you to everyone for, for being a part of this. I, I really do appreciate it. I wish you well. Stay safe, stay strong, and uh, we hope to see you uh, in person real soon.